Hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. Let me look into the camera like I always enjoy doing and welcome all of our family joining us online at our Northwest Cal State Bakersfield, even our outdoor venue. Come on, welcome everybody to church wherever they're at today, Southwest. Come on. We're in the fourth installment of this series called The Names of God. And I've just um, been enjoying the study of this series and helping you get to know God intimately, personally. This is the way God always intended to be known, not just as some distant, far away, abstract person, but he wanted to relate to you very personally. And all throughout the scriptures, he did. He showed up and revealed himself specifically to us so that we can relate to him personally. And in this series, we're getting to know a very personal God, a God that you can invite into your personal life situations like like Jehovah Saba, the Lord of heaven's armies, that when you come up against a battle and you come up against forces of darkness, you can be confident that you're stepping into that, not alone, but you got an angelic army and a God who is a general, who is a commander of those armies fighting with you. Can I get an amen, somebody? That, makes, that just allows you to fight different when you know this God. Last week, we talked about Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. That you got to let go of whatever you think is providing for you to experience the provision of the Lord, that his provision is better than whatever you're holding on to. Our, our theme verse in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 6, check it out with me again. God says, I will reveal my name to my people and they will come to know his power. That was God's intention. God's intention is not just you to know him intellectually or mentally, but that you would know the power of God and his power is inside of his name. It's revealed inside of his name. So this week, we're going to learn another powerful name of God that I'm so excited to introduce you to because I think we need him. We need God in our life. We need, we need this God to show up in our life. And I think you're here on purpose. You're listening in on purpose because God wants to reveal himself to you as Jehovah Shalom. Can somebody say Shalom? shalom. Here's what it means. The Lord is peace. Okay, to anyone in here today that that you know, I, I don't know, is, is feeling the pressure of it all. Your, your family, the expectations, the, your work, your finances, your, your friends, whatever those situations. Anyone in here who freaked out on somebody this week? You know what I'm talking about? Anyone freaked out this week? Someone flipped out about something. You know, it was a situation, it was a person. To anyone who just kind of like came to a point where it boiled, where, where, where it kind of spilled over, you need to know this God, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. I would love to introduce him to you. We're going to get really practical in this message today. But what I want to do is show you a few Old Testament stories and then get really practical in introducing Jehovah Shalom to you and how you can experience this God very personally in your life. And I think a lot of us need him today. I think it's why you're here today. Let me, let me show you where this name shows up, though, in Scripture. It's in the book of Judges chapter 6, and I only got a few verses maybe in your handout, so let me give you the context because I didn't get, didn't, didn't get all the scriptures in there to make room for it. But in this time, in the book of Judges, it's an Old Testament book, and it's in this time of Israel's history that they started to turn their back on God, or at least his principles and his ways, and, and, and that never ends up good for us. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. When you stop forgetting who God is and what he said and how to, and you think you know what to do and know how to do it your way, this is where Israel finds themselves in Judges chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. So check this out. God let the enemy win in the promised land. So you could be in the promised land and at the same time be out of the will of God. You can be in the place you're supposed to be, but functioning out of the will of God. So you're losing battles you should be winning. So you're experiencing defeat when you should be experiencing victory. So you're experiencing hostility when you should be owning peace. But we're out of the will of God. I'm in, this, I'm in the place I'm supposed to be, but functioning out of the will of God. Verse 12 says, the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon. And he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon says, pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has this happened to us? To which a lot of people maybe even in here are questioning today, because if God is with me, and if God is this shalom, peace God, and my provider, and all these things, then, then it just doesn't add up, because I'm, I'm in the promised land. I'm supposed to be a follower of Jesus. I'm supposed to have these things, but this isn't my real 
experience. So he's doubting who God is here. Why are all his wonders in, that our ancestors told about when, when he said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord seems to have abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midianites. This, so he's saying this doesn't make sense. He did it then. And he's doing it for them. I even see him blessing them. You know, but I don't see it in my life. So he begins to doubt who God is. He's doubting his power. He's even doubting who God says he is. And how, what God has called him to. Gideon was afraid because he experienced not only the presence of God, but because of what God was calling him to. And in verse 23, this one's in your handout. It says, the Lord said to him, peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon, and this is what I want, I want you to do today. Gideon built an altar. He built an altar to the Lord there, and he called it, the Lord is peace. Now, in our relationship with God, we should have, listen to me, many altar-building moments. You know what an altar did? If you ever read the New Testament, they built altars when they encountered God. Here's what the altar was. An altar was a place of prayer. It was a place of worship, but most of all, it was a place of remembrance of what God said, what God did, of who God is. And if I ever begin to doubt, I come back to this place of remembrance and say, no, 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 but, but, but this may be my experience, but I know God is, and God has said, and I know who I am, because this moment right here, today I hope is an altar-building moment for you, that you would understand and know this God in the middle of your pressures and, and anxieties and challenges and even crisis that are going to happen in all of our lives that we can come back to an altar moment like today and say, no, 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 I know Jehovah Shalom. He is the God who is peace in the midst of it because what the reality is we forget it. We're very forgetful. And when we forget this, who he is and who he said we are, we tend to try to take matters in our own hands with our own strength and our own capacity. Let me tell you one more Old Testament story. Tie this in. Because Moses did the same thing. Moses has seen God move and seen God work, and he's leading the Israelites out of Egypt and into the promised land. They're wandering in the wilderness, and theologians believe that this amount of people were, were four million, by the way. Four million people who, who of course, four million people, there's going to be fights and quarreling and drama going to happen and stuff, and there's going to be like he said, she said stuff. So what happened was Moses was the lone judge who sat and, and was an arbiter for the people. So they brought them all the problems. So every time that they would set up camp, that the pillar of cloud would stop and the fire would come and they would set up camp and they would stop. Moses would sit in the judge's seat and the people lined up and they brought Moses, the lone judge, all the problems, all the disputes, all the dra all drama. And he was the only one dealing with it. So you got to imagine this line has got to be long, dude. And it was like a never ending thing is no matter how hard he worked and how fast he tried to do it, that line just kept growing. So in Exodus chapter 18, verse 17, Jethro, his father-in-law comes along and says, Moses, what you're doing is what? It's not good. And I would say to a lot of you today that what you're doing is not good. It, it's, 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 just not, it's not good. It's, and it's not going to change if you keep doing it the way you're doing it. Because your job isn't the problem. And your marriage isn't the problem. You're in the right place. But if you keep handling the stress and the pressure the way you're handling it, it'll never change. Because maybe it's not her. And maybe it's not that. Maybe it has nothing to do with the place, but the way you're carrying the weight that God has given you is actually the problem. So, so what, the, the way we're doing it, the way, we're, hey, the way we're doing this is not good. Like you're going the right way and you love Jesus and he gave you that person and he gave you that job. You, you were so grateful for her just last year. And now, no, no, no. Now maybe it's the way. That we're here. So he says, this is not good. You and the people with you will certainly well wear yourself out for the thing that you're carrying all by yourself is too heavy for you. You're not able to do it alone. So what is God's remedy? God's remedy is not to remove the whole thing from you. Oh yeah, let me just go ahead and take that off your shoulders. No, he gives them a better way to handle the pressure. You can go read the prescription of it in Exodus chapter 18. He actually tells them to delegate, man, and start to get some people around you to handle it. You stop handling all yourself. But, but here's what he says in, in verse 23. And I hope today by the Spirit of God, you receive this today in your heart. Some of you need to know this God 
You need to know his peace, not, not the peace that the world gives, but his peace that is surpassing all understanding. Here's what it says, verse 23. If you do this, the key word is if, like I'm gonna give you some principles, some very practical principles to experience Jehovah Shalom. Like they're through his word that you can experience this kind of peace, his Shalom peace. It, the key word is if though. Is if, if you do this, God's going to get involved in it. God will direct you and he'll be able to, like, you're going to be able to live in the same stuff, the same situation. We're all living in the same world, in the same stuff, but you're going to be able to handle it with a different capacity. That you'll, you'll endure, you will be able to endure, and all these people with you will go to their place in peace. So God doesn't take away the troubles and he doesn't take away the, the drama but he does promise you an abundant peace in the middle of it. So let me give you an equation that we're all dealing with. Every one of us are dealing with the same equation today. Right now, we all are dealing with this. Here's the equation. When your pressure exceeds or is greater than your capacity, that's where stress and anxiety comes from. When your pressure is greater than your ability to endure it, to carry it, that's when I experience stress and anxiety. God, he, the bad news is this. Ain't, ain't nothing going to happen about the pressure side of the equation. Pressures will always be. You're going to have troubles. You're going to have trial. You're going to have pressure. The good news on this side of the equation is that God actually can do something about the capacity part. God wants to, desires to increase your capacity through the power of his presence that, that, that you would be able to, to Endure the pressure and not experience the stress and anxiety, but have his shalom, his peace. Okay? Let's go to the New Testament now, and then I'm going to get really practical here. New Testament, Jesus talking in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Jesus says, come to me. And I love this because he's like, hey, when you're tired of handling this the way you're handling it, and the way you're trying to do this in your own way, in your own strength, Moses, just, just trying to handle all yourself, when you're finally done trying to do it yourself, come to me. It's an invitation that he's giving us today. And I'm going to give you an invitation. I'm, five of them, in fact. Five ways five that you can experience Jehovah Shalom in your life. And it's going to be your decision whether you are going to build an altar today and trust him and come to him or not. So Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest and and now Jesus doesn't invite, it. the invitation is not, because you would think after he says this, it's like, here's a recliner, by the way, put your feet up and I'll go fight your battles. Don't you, don't you worry about it. I'm in charge. No, that's not what he does. That's not what he does at all. Jesus doesn't remove, he doesn't take anything off you. He actually puts the right thing on you. So he goes, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. And then he says, no, I'm not going to, I know you're burdened and heavy, but that's not solution. He goes, he goes, no, I'm not going to take it. I'm actually going to put a yoke on you. I'm going to take my yoke on you. So I can't, I'm not going to remove the pressure. You're burdened and you're weary and you're heavy. No, that's not solution. The solution is take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So you're going to still have to go through life. You're still going to have to handle the pressure. You're not going to be able to quit your job. You're not going to be able to quit your family. You're not going to be able to quit your fellowship. You're not going to be able to quit the things that are actually causing you pressure. But Jesus says, I can give you a different way to handle it. Here, put this on. You know what a yoke is? A yoke is, um, a yoke is this big wooden instrument with two holes in it that was put like on oxen. And it would help these oxen, two of them, plow together. There was metal rings on the outside that a farmer would hold and, and make sure that these, these oxen are plowing down the field uh, together. That word yoke, though, when you look at that Greek word that Jesus used, it wasn't, it's not the, you know, the Walmart version, one size fits all yoke, okay? It, it, it is, what, what it means literally is this well-managed, custom fit yoke. That's what that word means. And Jesus is a carpenter, so he would know about these things. This kind of yoke was used of farmers that love their animals and would bring in a carpenter to specifically measure the diameter, width, and shape of the animal, and then custom make a, a yoke for that animal so that 
so that when they are plowing, it's not getting bruised and bleeding and, and beat up by something that just doesn't fit right, that this is a perfectly custom fit yoke for them that, that they will do, you're able to do the same amount of work, but at the end of the day, at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, yet another year, you're not weary, burdened, and ready to give up on it. You have a, so you're doing the same work, but without the same amount of problems and troubles. Same amount of damage being done to yourself because you have his yoke on you. A well-managed, custom-fit yoke. He says, learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest. Look what he says, rest for your souls, not rest for your body. He says, rest for your souls, because rest isn't just kicking back, taking it easy. I like it. Don't get me wrong. I like a nap. I'm going to take one today. Okay? But he's, he's, he's not saying, th this is rest for your souls. Rest, the rest he's talking about here, which when we, we'll look at shalom in a moment, a, a, another, uh, inside of this beautiful word shalom is actually a rest, true rest. So what Jesus is inviting when he says, come to me and I'll give you rest, he's talking about shalom. This is Greek in here, so it wouldn't translate over, but he's talking about come to me and I will, you will experience. See, rest is not, rest is the condition of your soul so that you can go through the same troubles, the same pressures, the same challenges you had this year. You're gonna go through some similar ones next year. I don't mean to be a, a doom prophet on you or something like that, okay? But you're gonna go through some troubles, man. You're gonna go through some difficulties, some finances, some relationships, some friends are gonna try to walk away from you. You're gonna go through stuff throughout life, but, but after you put on this yoke, you're gonna go through it without the bruise and bleeding. With, with a new capacity, to handle it, that at the end of it, you could say, it is well with my soul. Yeah, no, no, I, I get it. I'm still going through the same stuff, but it is well with my soul. For my yoke is easy, Jesus says, and my burden is light. So I look throughout the scriptures where God invites us into this, invites us into experience his peace. Remember, Jehovah is his, his relational name, this name that we can, ex his, a person we can experience. And God wants us to experience his peace. I'm going to give you five ways for not, not for your stress to go away. I'm not going to give you five ways for the pressure to be diminished, for the stress to be removed, for the, you know, the disaster to be averted. No, it's, I'm going to give you five ways that in the middle of it, you could have shalom. You can know peace. So we can experience Jehovah shalom when, write these down, number one, when we allow our bodies and our minds to recover. See, the truth is, you have, a lot of you have the ability, you're just not taking the time to recover. And what I mean by recovery, I'm talking about slowing down for long enough to like sharpen your saw. You're, you, you've heard the story, right? Of, that, of someone just chopping away at a tree and he's, he's, he's chopping all day and he's got a whole field to do and he gets halfway done, it's harder and harder and harder because that ax is getting dull. And someone comes along, his friend comes along and says, hey buddy, you need to stop for a moment, and sharpen the ax. And he says, I can't, I got too many trees to chop down. Well, if you just stop for a moment though and, and come back and rest and sharpen this is Mo moses you're trying to I understand there's a line i understand you got a lot to do i understand there's pressures and demands on you but if you don't learn how to pull back you'll never experience shalom you'll never experience this god who is our peace we can experience him when we allow our bodies and our minds to recover i think we need to talk a lot less about the chemical imbalances of our day and the lifestyle imbalances of our day because what a lot of us would rather do is not, not use the prescriptions that the Bible prescribes. And we want to use a prescription that'll, that'll bring it into balance. We want to treat the symptoms and not make a lifestyle change that can actually cause you to endure through God's plan. And, God, and so God's lifestyle change all throughout the scriptures, the lifestyle change for this one is called the Sabbath. And I'm not a seventh-day Adventist or anything. I'm not, I don't, I don't, I'm not talking about like you need to religiously obey a certain day. I'm talking about the principle of God's word to rest, to come into a place where you stop, where you cease, where you reflect, where you remember, where you rejoice, where you bring rest to your mind and your body. Like I have an entire day and recover. For some of you, it's, it, it could be today, if, that's your, if this is a good day for you. A lot of people, it is Sunday. It's their day of worship. You come and feed your spirit, and then you go. 
This isn't my rest day. A lot of you know this ain't my rest day. I work all day, okay? I'm pouring out. Monday is my rest day where I stop. I stop doing all physical work, mental work. The only thing I'm going to do is stuff that adds value to me, that energizes me. Tomorrow, Exodus chapter 20, verse 9 and 2. Doesn't matter what day it is, you need to find a day, because here's what it says, God's principle. For you have six days in which you're to do your work. But the seventh day is the day of rest dedicated to me. So there's a lot of other days you can dedicate to other things. Go dedicate that, work on that, fix that, get that, grind for that, go for that, have that goal, have that, go, go, do it, go for it. But a seventh day is dedicated to me. You dedicate all the days, but, but this seventh day, he says, is dedicated. Notice it's a day. It's not a church service. It's an entire day. So you don't come and feed the spirit, but then go, you know, go, I think you ought to eat good on your Sabbath, eat some good meals. You, sh- you should go turn on some NFL. I'm going to go put on some football and I'm going to go take a nap. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to eat football. Now, I'm not going to catch one. I'm not going to catch any of the game. I'm going to wake up in fourth quarter or something, okay? <laughs> you got you to gotta stop. You're going too hard. And some of you are like, Jason, isn't that an Old Testament lot? No. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 says this. There remains then a Sabbath rest for God's people. So check this out, just as God's name, his names reveal his eternal character that we can still see today. His law reveals his eternal principles. So I don't, we don't need to obey the law, but God who gave the law, he's showing us a little bit of his heart and his principles within it. So there is a principle of Sabbath rest that still is today for anyone who enters God's rest, also rest from their work, just as God did from his. And he says, let us therefore Make every effort to enter that rest. Like, work hard so that you can rest. Like, you're like, work hard all those six days. Do what you need to do. Get it done so that on this day, on your seventh day, on your Sabbath day, you can actually come into a place of rest. Like, like pull away. Look at your week. Look at your day and eliminate the things that are sucking life out of you and rest your bodies and your mind. So rest your, rest your mind. Don't, let your, don't do the busy work in your mind even. Don't go to your computer and, and start to work early on that day. No, no, no. Every one of us need this time where our minds, not just our bodies, but our minds and our souls come back in alignment with God. Okay, because we drift. We, we, get, we get worried. We doubt. We get discouraged. We get disappointed. We, we freak out on people. All these things, but then we got to come to a place in our days and our week where we just fix our thoughts. Philippians chapter four says it like this. Fix your thoughts. On what is true, this is a scripture that needs to be a part of your Sabbath, needs to be a part of your rest, where you enter in to this kind of thing. Fix your thoughts on that what is true and honorable and right, because there's a lot of false, dishonorable, and wrong that we've been looking at, thinking about, that we've been filling our thoughts with. What is pure and lovely, man, we've been looking at things and and hating and impure. and, And he says, admirable, think on these things. If it's excellent and worthy of praise, keep putting to practice all you learn and receive from me everything you have heard me and saw me do. And then he says this, then the God of peace, that's Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace will be with you. You can experience this God when you rest your body and your mind. Number two, you can experience Jehovah Shalom only when you know who we are. So if you don't know who you are, then you can't know peace. You always live in some sort of frustration and some sort of disconnect if you don't know who you are. You're going to begin to believe the narratives inside your own mind that other people have told you who you are. Even the devil tries to tell you who you are. And some of you are, you're you're, you're listening to your own voice, your own self-negative limiting talk over yourself. You're thinking all these things and believing these things. There's a reason why God, when he showed up to Gideon, he first spoke to his identity. Hey, Mighty warrior, get in, you are my mighty warrior. He had to get him to believe not only who he was, but who Gideon was in order for him to do what God wanted him to do. God will always work on your identity first. And if you don't know who you are, you'll never truly know rest. Some of you right now, maybe even a lot of you are under what's called peer pressure. You're, 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 You're letting everybody else, including the devil, define who you are. And, and researchers actually show that we are both in our day, in our, in our time of history, we are the most narcissistic and self-esteem, uh, low self-esteem society of all time. That's a terrible combination. 
to be narcissistic and, and low self-esteem. That combination, they say, uh, is what amplifies anxiety, stress, and depression. Listen to me, times 100. When you have those two qualities of narcissism and low self-esteem, the lack of clarity of who you are is robbing you of peace. You could be in the right place. You could be in the right job. You could be in the right church, the best church in the world. No, I'm just kidding. Best. And you could, be, you could be in the right whatever. I'm oh, just kidding. I'll just calm down. I'm not, okay. You could be in the right place, but not just experiencing his peace because you don't know who you are. It's a great illustration of this that, that I think illustrates it perfectly. I got right here for you. Okay. So, so you got a frying pan. You got a frying pan and a pickleball paddle. All right. So uh, this is a popular thing now. It came back. I did it like 25 years ago, and all of a sudden it's cool again. I did it before it's cool. Okay. So, if you don't know who you are, it is at best. It's ineffective. At worst, it is completely destructive. So when you don't know who you are, if, if the frying pan doesn't know that it was made to like fry some really good eggs or potatoes or some bacon, hallelujah, okay? And you try to, you, you can use this as an ineffective pickleball paddle. You can do it. You're going to be very ineffective, but you can do it. However, if you tried to use this pickleball paddle, as a frying pan that is completely destructive to how God designed you and created you. And some of you are experiencing the frustration of an unfit life, of just like not being in your design. And there's others of you that are destroying your life because you're living somebody else's expectation. You're living, I don't know who it is. It could be, it could be you, it could be your parents, it could be, it could be the devil himself telling you you are things that you are not. If you don't know, you know what the culprit of this thing is? The culprit of us not, like, I think the culprit is, go ahead and take these from me. The culprit is comparison. Galatians chapter six, go there with me. Galatians chapter six says it like this. Each one should test their own actions. Then they can take pride in themselves alone without comparing. God didn't make me like that. God didn't give me those gifts. He didn't give me those strengths without comparing themselves to someone else, for each one should carry their own load. See, the clearer you are in, in who God says you are, then the more peace you're gonna have. If you know, I am a child of God. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I, I am an ambassador of God. I'm in the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm an heir of the kingdom of God. I am chosen, adopted, redeemed, justified, made alive in Christ. That's what his word says. You got to know what his word says. I'm a citizen of heaven. I am God's workmanship, his craftsmanship. I am raised and seated in heavenly places in Christ. I am no longer a slave. I am free. When you know who you are, it brings peace to your soul. If you don't know who you are, you will never know this peace. You'll never know it. I'm trying to help you experience, truly experience Jehovah Shalom. You got to know. Not only do you got to take some time to pull away, you have to rest your body and your mind. It's how God designed you. It's how you to experience him more deeply. Some of you don't know. You need a Sabbath. Some of you need to know who you are. How, who God, and then number three, it's connected to it. If you want to experience Jehovah Shalom, we need to know what we're created to do. By the way, you can't know what you're supposed to do until you know who you are. Until you know you're a frying pan, you didn't know you made eggs so good. Okay? Until you know who you are and then reveals what God wants me to do. See, the happiest people on earth, the people with the most peace on this earth aren't the people with the less problems. The people with the most peace have something in their life that actually is making a difference in their life. They got, they're doing something with their life. They have something in their life. So their, their assignment from God and their purpose from God actually overshadows the pain and pressure that they're experiencing. They got the same pain you got, they got the same pain I got, but they're carrying it differently because they got something better that they're working for, okay? They, 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 when you know, you're gonna experience Jehovah Shalom when you know what you were created 
to do. See, Paul said, the apostle Paul said, I'm hard pressed on every side, but it don't, it don't bother me. He called them light and momentary troubles. Paul didn't, wait, he didn't experience light. No, he did not. He was shipwrecked. He was poisoned, bit by a snake. They stoned him. He was, he was at to uh, wrestle with bandits and, and threats everywhere and thrown into prison. Light and momentary. How can you say, Paul, light and momentary troubles after all you experience? Here's why. He says, I got my eyes fixed on things that are not seen. Second Peter chapter 1 says it like this. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. There is, you need to start confirming what God has said about you and how God has designed you. Okay, that's why, this is why every week you hear the same announcement here at Discovery Church. It's, it's like, get on the Discovery track. Hey, go to the Discovery, the Discovery track. You, you need to know the Discovery track. Uh, it's the best way. Here's why that announcement keeps coming up, this Discovery track thing here at Discovery. It's the best way we know how to pastor you. Is, is to help you know who you are and what God has called you to do. Because the reality is, I would love to, but I can't take away the pain. I can't remove the, the traumas of your past, and I can't take away storms in your future. I can't. And, and by the way, Jesus isn't going to remove all those either. But what I can do is help you discover who God says you are and what he's called you to do. I can help you get some things in your life that can help you endure and experience a peace in the middle of it. Experience the presence of God, Jehovah Shalom, in the middle of all that. He says, confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, look what he says, you'll never stumble. Come on, if I give you that guarantee, how many of you would not want to sign up right now? You will never stumble. If you know who you are and what God has called you to do, what he's called you to do, you'll never stumble and you'll receive a rich welcome into an eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What an amazing promise when we know what we're created to do. But here's the reality. Your calling has a competitor. And you know what your competitor is? The competitor to your calling is all that temporary stuff. It's all the, the busy work. The worst competitors, like the primary competitors of your calling, of your purpose, of what God has called you to do. Listen to me. It's not your pressure. It's not your problems. It's not even those people. You know what the, you know what the worst competitors are? It's that busy stuff. It's the stuff you're doing that you weren't created to do. That's, that's that stuff that's getting in the way. If you would just identify and elim eliminate those non essentials and get as much of your life aligned to the calling of God on your life, to how he's created you, what he has purposed you for. I'm telling you, you would experience Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace in your life. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse six, though, here's the problem. We're like, it says better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls and choosing, uh, to toil and chasing after the, the wind. Like, God's prescription is live a one handful life. And we love grabbing two handfuls. I got two hands. Why not, Pastor? Because you want tranquility. Because you want peace. Because you want to experience this God, Jehovah Shalom. And if you do want to experience Him, this God in your life, you need to know what you were created to do and leave room for Him. Better one handful than two and all the toil and all the stress and all the chasing. Okay, y'all get something out of this, you guys? Okay, you can experience Jehovah Shalom. Number four, when we are supported by others. Some of you like this and some of you don't. Let's be honest, okay? Moses needed to get others around him. He was trying to do it all himself. The, the prescription was, no, you can't do it alone. Gideon, God didn't say, Gideon, go get him, man. You're the mighty warrior. Go take them all out. No, he put some people around him. God, all throughout the scriptures, you guys, some of you are refusing to submit to this. You're refusing to submit to the way God designed you, the way he created you, and you're still trying to do it yourself. You're trying to do it all by yourself, fight by yourself, figure it out by yourself. You're not letting anybody in to the problem, to the challenges. You think you got to be the judge sitting on the seat and fixing everything, and you, until you submit to how God designed you, you'll never know this peace, the peace that God wants you to know. Every description of the church in the Bible is a group. 
It's a group. It's, it's a fellowship. It's the family of God. It's a body. It's a flock. Jesus' favorite definition of the church is, is a flock. You ever watch like National Geographic or you see a clip of those antelopes in a herd and then one dumb old antelope gets off by itself and then the lion has some lunch? You know what I'm talking about, okay? That's like, and I'm not even talking about geographically together. I'm talking about relationally together. The studies, the studies, as I was researching this, and I've, you know, many different sermons I've done, but again, just reviewing that, isolation is the number two, in some studies, the number three cause of, of anxiety, stress, and depression. Isolation. Many of you are feeling isolated today. You got people all around you. You got 164 groups that you could sign up for. You got amazing community. You got people you're working with. You got family that live just 20 minutes away, but you're feeling Isolate. So I'm not talking about geographically, but relationally. We're not being supported by others. And the Bible talks about this in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It says, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toils. There was no end to his stress. But his eyes weren't content with his wealth. He said, okay, if I'm, you know, here's the solution. I'll just make more money. I'll just get more stuff. And the Bible says, no, two are better than one. Because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity the one who falls and has no one to help him up. In other words, the pressure is still going to be there, and you're even going to get knocked down at times, but God has, will give you capacity when you have other people around you to help you endure through it. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one keep warm, though, look what he says, though one may be overpowered, and I hate to say this to you, but some of you right now are being overpowered by things, that, that you were meant to conquer. And, and there are things, by the way, that aren't going to change. I can't change it, and God's can't, God can't change it. He's not going to. I'm not saying he can't. God is going to change it. He says, one may be overpowered, but two can defend themselves. And a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. God says, it's still there, but guess what? I am going to get you around people to actually carry it with others. So you don't have to carry it alone. Jesus says it like this in Matthew 18, 30. For where two or three gather in my what? In his name. There I am with him. This is how you experience this God. It's, it's, and some of you are resistant to this. Some of you are more accepting this, but some of you have been resisting to getting support from others. You've gone through some things in your life that you've never told anybody. And that's just been a routine, routine thing for some of you, whether it's a tough week that you had that you just swallow down and tough it out, or it's the thing that someone did to you when you were 12 years old. And, and until you can, you won't experience the depth of Jehovah Shalom until you get other people in your life. Jesus says, this is me, I'm right there. I'm in the midst of that. That's the way I designed you, that you would experience me. When two or three of you gather in my name, get in a group. It's how you were designed. And you, I, you don't need another thing to do, and I'm not trying to prescribe you another thing to do. I'm trying to get you into a place where you can be honest, work some stuff out, carry it with some brothers and some sisters. I can't promise you it's going to be better. In fact, prophetically, the Bible says it's going to get worse. But you can know Jehovah Shalom, God our peace, in the middle of it. And most importantly, here, here's the fifth. You can experience Jehovah Shalom only when you invite God to actually help you. Because some of you, listen to me, some of you love God. And you might even love His Word, you love worship and all these things, but yet to invite Him in to be your peace in the middle of your storm. Like what, I'll tell you like Jethro told Moses again, what you're doing isn't good. It's not good. And you can't handle this alone. And I said all that just to lead to this, this one point right here that you have to invite God to help you. I, I was talking to someone recently and they said, I don't, just don't think God's helping me out with this thing. They had something they were going through. And I started just this conversation, ask them questions about their faith and, and come to find out that this is how they primarily describe God. This is who God was, my helper, my friend, which is, that, that's his name. The Holy Spirit is a helper. And Jesus did call, he said, no longer I call you slaves, but I call you my, my, 
friend. Listen to me. But before he's friend, he's Lord. Some of you want shalom. But you need Jehovah. You'd love to leave that part out and just get the peace. Isaiah 9, 6 says, and his name will be called the Prince of Peace. This is, this is who he is. Now, that word Prince of Peace, it's two words, Sar Shalom. And Sar is where we get the Sar of, of the Russians or Caesar of Romans. Sar in Hebrew is the one in charge. He's Lord. He's chief. He's general. So he can't help you. He wants to help you, but he can't help you if he's not in control first. So you want God to help you, but he's not your Lord. He's, he's the prince of shalom, of peace. That word shalom it means peace, rest, wholeness, completeness, contentment. That is what he is the Lord of, the controller of, the chief of, the general of rest. He's the general of completeness in your life. He's the general of wholeness in your life. He's the general of contentment in your life. Lord and peace go together. You cannot have peace without him being your Lord. And some of you are expecting something from God that you never created covenant for. Let me show it to you in scripture. I'll show it to you a few places. Psalm chapter four, verse eight. I will lie down and sleep in peace. Oh, I love that. For you alone, look what it says, O Lord, make me the, dwell in safety. Psalm 29, 11, for the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. You can't have it both ways. Acts chapter 10, verse 36 in the New Testament. This is the message of the good news for the people of Israel, that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is and adds Lord of all. In case you're not convinced, one more. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. Through what? Through our Lord. Our, the one in charge. He's Lord. And the prince, listen to me, has principles that you can't ignore. It's called the word of God. And he invites you in. You can know this peace but there are principles you need to start implying. And in fact, Isaiah chapter 48, 18 says, if you had only paid attention to my commands, to my word, your peace would have been like a river flowing in your life. If you'd only paid attention, I had it for you, but you just, you were committed to do it your way to rule your life. What are the, write this down. Most of our stress actually comes from ignoring God's principles. If we're honest with ourselves, we look at every area of stress in our life, most of it, if we were to look at, am I practicing the principles of God's word in that area? Am I inviting Jehovah Shalom to rule as Prince of Peace here? Is he Lord of Peace here? Most of us would not answer yes. It comes from actually ignoring the principles of God. What are the principles? There are a bunch of them, but let me just summarize it in one word in Matthew 6, 33. First. First. Let's sum let me summarize all of it, all of his principles. Seek God first, his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will, will be given to you as well. So put God first in your, put God first in your day. Put God first in your week. You're doing it right now on Sunday, by the way. You're putting him first. Put God first in your thoughts, in your voice, in your, the first thing you say, thank you, Jesus. The, the, put God first in your, in your finances. Put God first in your year, in every year of your, in your, of your life. In fact, peace, write this down, comes from when I put God first. That's when he's the Lord, when he's the one in charge. When he's the general, when he's first, that's where peace comes from. When he's prince of it. Let me say it another way. Write this down. I'm going to pray for you. True shalom can come from Jehovah alone. And you want that. I know you do. Some of you came in today under the pressure of it all. You're feeling it. You're feeling the weight of it. You're feeling the weight of this world. You're feeling the weight of the stress. You're feeling the weight of your 
of your finances. Some of you are feeling the weight of your own decisions and choices, thinking, how am I going to get out of this? What you need to know is this God, the God who is peace, that doesn't, like, all that stuff is still, some, a lot of it's still going to be there tomorrow, but God, what he wants to do is increase your capacity through his presence to endure differently. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.